out uh, in the county for early voting, but that's true throughout the state, Tony says, and around the country as well. We're seeing a pretty robust turnout for early voting. Any suspicions as to why you think that might be? Well, I think the, the obvious answer is the the presidential election. Everyone wants to come out and vote for that. And I'm uh, certainly glad that voters are coming out to vote in, in large numbers. Um, but I can't help but think about on primary election day, wherein this county and, and most of the state of West Virginia, these elections, like it or not, are really decided then, and our turnout uh, was terrible, uh, both in the state and, and particularly uh, in Berkeley County. And so, um, you know, I think that we have to continue to do our part to, to educate voters to, of the importance of voting in the primary, not just in the general, because you look at these races across the Eastern Panhandle and across the state, um, and you're going to it's hard to find competitive races in the general election everybody's coming out the vote and that's great um, but those uh, elections in the primary are very competitive uh, in the republican primary and we get six and eight percent turnout which is uh, unfortunate i want to ask you to comment on this as we were discussing in the last half hour with delegate mike kite about the eastern panhandle delegation i read a brad no quote i'm going to read a ken matson one here now uh and re- i don't know what he means by this because they were talking Mike Height was talking about the popularity of Mike Hornby in the Char- in Charleston area, and he says he owns a radio station. I don't know what Ken means by that other than he does. That's factually correct on a radio station. Also, it was, I talked about Roger Hanshaw saying that uh, if you look around at the leadership out of the Eastern Panhandle in the House, about how seriously he takes the Eastern Panhandle, because there were so many people who were chairs of so many important things. And Ken said uh, they pat us on the head with a few gratuitous vice chairs. Is that the way you look at the Eastern Panhandle delegation, whether it's in the Senate, in the House, a few gratuitous vice chairs as a show of appreciation of the importance of the Eastern Panhandle to the state? No. Um, The short answer is no. Um, I I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know. I I think Mike Height made a very good point um, that, you know, until you're really down there, until you really see – the influence and, and the process, um, you know, it's really easy to be a, a keyboard gangster. And I think um, that that's the two of the quotes that you read today. I think that's about all they are. Um, if bless their hearts ever applied to anybody, it's those two commenters on the Facebook post daily. Um, I, look, we go down there and, and it, it's a long drive. We put a lot of time and effort. People are away from their families. Um, and then we deal with comments like that are just frustrating because um, the Eastern Panhandle delegation does a great job. We, we work extremely well together. Um, you know, it, it's something that we have a passion for um, to help our area, and we do the best we can. And, you know, I, I don't I, – I, you look at the, the leadership in the Senate uh, with having the Senate president, the judiciary chairman, um, those aren't gratuitous vice chairmanships. You look at the House with the majority leader – uh, of course, Paul just left as the as the speaker pro tem, but but they have, John Hardy, vice chair of finance. No, those folks are leaving, and that's not Roger Hanshaw's fault. That's not um, anybody in Charleston's fault. Those gentlemen decided to to, to do different things, and so um, you know we have uh, a very good uh, group of young delegates uh, in tenure, not in age, but in tenure. Uh, who are really moving up or who are doing a great job. Uh, Senator Rucker, uh, uh, there's no one that outworks Senator Rucker in Charleston, and, and she does a, a, an outstanding job. And so, you know, I, I, as you can tell, I take offense to comments like that from people that, frankly, don't know what they're talking about. Uh, delegate uh, Householder, who is the House Majority Leader, and I guess still is until the end of the term. Uh, the EP has led the charge for right to work, uh, repeal of prevailing wage, tax reform, single-member districts. We have been very effective that was from eric householder bill yeah yeah, jason uh taking umbrage at some of our facebook commenters i i think is uh uh it's not really appropriate. Uh, we're all uh, allowed to say what we want to say. Uh, all of our representatives got into uh, got into the race and to the duties knowing fully well a lot of travel was involved a lot away from the family was involved that's part of the job of doing business of course it is it is and but then throwing that back in the face of some of the facebook commenters i don't think is really the most professional thing that i've heard well is that a question no that's a statement well i'll respond then i mean look I, there are a lot of great commenters on the Facebook page that, that offer a lot of things that 
um, have a lot of ideas and, and that are really impactful in a positive way. But I've just pointed out the two that were um, mentioned today that it is constant negativity on every legislator from the Eastern Panhandle on a daily basis. And look, I'm not asking for anybody to pat me on the back from taking time away from my family for uh, driving down there. I'm just putting it into perspective that that's what we do. And we choose to do it. We choose to do it at, at very minimal pay. And that that's on us. That's what we want to do. But at the same time, uh, when people just throw, uh, you know, take shots at us every day that are unfounded uh, and without um, uh, basis of fact, yeah, I'm going to take offense to that. I don't take offense to the 99% of the other comments on, on the, the feed that are that are positive or e they can even be critical uh, or have questions. That's one thing. But when when it's nothing but negativity out of the same two people every day, yeah, I'm going to take offense to that. Maria. So, Jason, sort of switching gears, um, what do you see as the preeminent uh, uh, issue or issues this year coming up. I know that we have um, a special session coming up, that we have um, some other things to work through, but um, moving forward with a new delegation um, and what would you perceive to be the most important things on the forefront, at least in your mind? Well, it, it, and actually I don't think we're gonna have any more special sessions leading up before February. Uh, I will say that um, we are, uh, as you know, this, with Senate President Blair uh, leaving the Senate, that, that we have a Senate president's race and, and we're obviously going to have a new governor. So, you know, it, we're going to kind of, I don't want to say wait, because certainly we're going to do our job to, to put forth some legislation. We're working on, on, on different things. But, um, you know, really that executive is going to come out with an agenda. We're interested to see what um, future Governor Morrissey is going to come out with his agenda and what his list of priorities are. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously very uh, interested in seeing what his uh, budget looks like moving forward uh, for the state. But, uh, you know, I think that we'll continue to try to, to uh, limit government. I think we'll try to continue to keep a flatland budget as best we can, or at least not uh, raise it beyond uh, the natural growth of, of our uh, revenue collections. Um, you know, I think that we're starting to see, you know, we're not going to have these huge surpluses or, or we may not moving forward. So, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look for efficiencies in government. And that's, um, you know, kind of the direction I want to see it going. If, when, Senator Rucker, you made reference to her mm -hmm. being one of the hardest working um, senators, I would certainly um, agree with that. Um, do you believe she'll be in the mix for Senate president this time? Of course, we remember um, the last situation. I don't, uh, maybe I'm um, overstepping here asking you for your opinion, but just out of curiosity. No, that, it, it's a good question. And uh, Senator Rucker and I have had several conversations as it relates to the next Senate president. Um, you know, she and I keep in contact a lot on the issue and, and other issues. Um, it is very much an internal process. There are uh, three candidates that I think are, are really vying for it. And, you know, we're having constant conversations and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful that we're going to come out of this um, after our caucus in December, very unified uh, with the next president. Okay. Jason, a lot of uh, discussion recently about PEIA. Mm -hmm. What is your solution to PEIA? Well, you know, I hear the term fix PIA all the time, and I, I'm not sure what um, everybody means by that. And and certainly the, the increase to premiums is not something any of us want to do. Um, but at the same time, when you look at uh, the, the, call, the uh, increase in the general inflation versus uh, medical inflation, uh, medical inflation has outpaced general inflation tremendously uh, over the past several years. Um, last year, uh, the legislature, um, you know, re kind of reinstated that 80-20 that, that Delegate Height talked about earlier, where the employer pays, the state pays 80%, the employee pays 20%. Um, and, you know, this past special session, we uh, infused another $87 million into PEIA. Uh, but what you're seeing now uh, from, you know, a, a slight increase in the premium, uh, I think on average is about thirty dollars a month. Thirty couple dollars a month is what this is going to mean. Uh, but when you look at what the legislature has done, um, you know we've given five five percent pay raises to state employees over the past six years. 
uh, over a 21 and a quarter percent tax uh, personal income tax reduction, which obviously affects those people uh, in uh, starting in January of 25. That number is going to go up to 27 percent uh, personal income tax reduction. There are, the, I think the biggest problem with PIA is when you look at it is that most insurance plans, uh, the premium is based on your risk. If you're older, if you're unhealthy, uh, you're going to pay a, a higher premium. If you're younger and healthy, you're going to pay lesser premium. But the way PIA uh, sets premiums is based on salary. Uh, and so you base them, the PIA bases the amount of money they collect based on what the employee uh, wages are. But what the program, what PIA pays out in expenses is based on the, how much they use the coverage, which is based on their health. Uh, so I think that is a fundamental problem with you collect money one way and you pay it out a different way mm -hmm. and you wonder why we're upside down. And I think that's that's the real problem. Now, what PIA is, is looking to institute is uh, some kind of smaller uh, supplemental type insurance kind of like an AFLAC that would be available to certain employees. You're seeing some deductibles go up a little bit, some co-pays that go up a little bit. And I think that's aimed at trying to, to not increase premiums so much on people that don't use it, but again, get back to the folks that use the insurance the most, should they be the ones to pay a little bit more? And I think that that's what you would, I think that's what most people would assume should happen because again most insurance are risk-based now what they're also doing they have a wellness program if you want if the employee wants to get involved in the wellness program that i think is done digitally um, where it you know it tracks some of your um, uh, lifestyle your habits of maybe some and i don't know this I, i'm speculating that some of this is based on exercise some of this may be based on your your diet but can save the employee a um, hundred dollars annually on their premiums if they you know this is optional they don't if they don't you know, want to participate in this program, they don't have to, but but it can. So I think there's, that's where the PEI is going, and that's what they're doing to ensure the sustainability of the program. Would you go as far as what Mike Height suggests, that the government should not be in the insurance business or be in the hospital business? Well, I think that I, I, I'm interested in looking to see, is there a better way to do it? Is there a way where we could privatize this, where the coverage would be uh, just as good or better, uh, would the premiums... Um, uh, be the same price or lower, uh, and is there a financial benefit to the state? If it checks those boxes, then then certainly I don't have a problem with privatizing. Um, but I tend to believe right now that the premiums that employees are paying with PEIA is less than what the average West Virginian is paying who has private insurance. Now I could be wrong about yeah. that, but I'm I'm pretty sure there that even with some of these increases are still getting insurance uh, at a lower rate than, than they would um, in the private sector. Part of the your argument a few couple of minutes ago about the, uh, uh, the increase $30 uh, per month per individual, you mentioned that we've been given various pay raises, which we have, but it's my understanding West Virginia is either 49th or 50th in terms of pay to the, to the teachers. Uh, so that in some degree negates the argument that we've been given pay raises the last few years. Well, I mean, I think you look at a third, a $33 increase. I think it's 32 or $33 uh, monthly increase to the premium, but the pay raise, and, and we're, if we're talking about teachers, th I think that pay raise uh, is right around $2,400 a year when we've done those 5%. It goes up, obviously, as you give uh, raises and the salary goes up, the next time you give 5%, it's a little bit more. Right now, I think that's around $2,400, uh, which is $200 a month. So, uh, and we've done that five times now. And uh, and they've received uh, a reduction in the personal income tax. So it, it has been uh, revenue positive for the employees. That there's no question about that. Uh, but to your point, uh, yeah, we're still lagging behind um, uh, in some in uh, in pay uh, as it relates. Uh, but we are making steps in the right direction. And you know, you look at these pay raises uh, for uh, state employees. Uh, I believe it is is well in excess of a hundred million dollars, and that's base billing. That's not a hundred million dollars one time. So when you know people say, "Well, we have you know five hundred million dollar surplus. Why don't we just give everybody a pay raise?" Well, that surplus is one time money, uh, and then when you give you know pay raises, which we've done and I've supported, and we absolutely should have done um, that one hundred twenty five to thirty five million dollar range. You know that's base building every year. So you have to be mindful 
um, not to get too far over your skis when you see the natural growth in the state's economy and the budget of about $150 million. Well, and then I think, too, um, again, the whole school aid formula is a whole, you know, who even understands all of that? Um, but also, if I'm not mistaken, teachers receive step increments based on their years of experience. And I don't know that people talk about that as much. I mean, it's still, yes, we recognize that the teachers are, are um, terribly underpaid. Um, but in addition to those raises that the legislature gives, based on your years of experience, you get a natural bump up to a certain point, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, just kind of comment there. Um, and you're exactly right. There is that step increase every year that the, the salary does go up based on your years of service. That's correct. Some of those bumps are about $500, though, aren't they? I, to be honest, I, I, I can't tell you. Um, I, they're not significant. I've seen that chart. It's yeah. about 10 bucks a week. Yeah, and, there's, and some of it is based on the... Um, some of it's more. Yeah, well, uh, some of it is is uh, based on the education that the that the teacher has as well. Mm -hmm. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here on the program, interims uh, coming up in uh, another, I guess, two weeks. Do you have any idea what's on tap for those? Uh, we we have we don't have the schedule yet. Um, I serve as the chair of um, jails committee, uh, the interim committee in the Senate uh, on jails and, and prisons. So uh, we're working on that agenda. Um, uh, moving forward. So. That's quieted down a little bit. I'm not sure if that's because it's election season or because some things have been solved. Which do you suspect? Well, it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, I will give um, the the uh, head of corrections, um, uh, Billy Marshall, I'm trying to think of his title, uh, Billy Marshall, uh, who has done an outstanding job, I believe, uh, at corrections. Um, and, and he has really uh, taken on some of the issues that, that made the press in, in some issues and, and there I've been contacted uh, several times uh, by family members of, of inmates at ERJ uh, and any time that they uh, have contacted me and said hey you know my family member says this is an issue or that's an issue or I'm concerned about a B or C uh, I called director Marshall and and say hey look this is uh, commissioner that's the title commissioner Marshall I say hey this is what someone is reaching out to me about and it's usually within 24 hours he gets back to me with um, you know this is what's going on if there was an issue this is how we've corrected it or you know is that inmate may be misinforming the the family member and sometimes that goes on but but they have he has been extremely responsive uh, and his team has done an excellent job uh, they have really uh, turned um, the corrections around uh, from a standpoint of the conditions and, and and just the way the whole operation to be honest and, and he deserves a lot of credit for that the senate is 31 to 3 right now any idea what it will be after this election uh, in the ballpark of the same i think you will you, you will you pick up another seat or two or lose a seat or two i think it's i think it's possible uh to pick up a seat i think it's possible to lose a seat any predictions in the house 80 90 11 right now uh, I would say not, if uh, this is, I don't have any of these races to uh, in my mind, in the forefront of my mind, but I would say 92 to eight, 93 to seven, somewhere in there. I've been hearing that number will increase. So oh, you're hearing the same thing. That's though. definitely the odds on favor to Steve. Right. Any, uh, any uh, interest in uh, particular committees uh, going back for this uh, new term with a new governor in terms of being a chair and, and a new president? So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. But, but certainly, right. Yeah. I'm, Are you supporting anybody right now? Percentage president? Uh, yeah, and I, I don't think I have a problem saying this publicly that um, um, I'm supporting uh, Senator Tarr. Eric Tarr, mm -hmm. who is currently the finance chair. He is currently. Yeah. Yeah. That would mean there would be a new finance chair. There would be. <laughs> I, I'm sure Senator Tarr, if he's elected Senate president, will um, choose the best person that he thinks for that role. Thank you for your time this morning, Always Senator Bear. Thank you. <laughs>